particular fusor was giving 80 times output power, and we also got more out by heat flow. Um, we also saw this with the nickel cap. It's, it, it's, go ahead. Flash the graph giving 80 times excess power into the is, is it possible to go back to your geographic as ADX power? Uh -huh. A little bit more about it? Please. For example, we melted the anode with this. What did you do? What was the experiment? Was this, this was a, a dual anode fusor where what we do is uh, deposit gold on it. And uh, then we switch. It's actually uh, similar to what Cravens did later. Uh, and what we ended up getting was with the dual anode fuse or gold anode after co-deposition. Uh, that's what we got. What did you co-deposit? Uh, from a palladium cathode, then we switched to gold. I'm sorry, did palladium take co-deposit? Correct. And then gold got co-deposit? No. Essentially, the gold is relative. When you have gold as an anode, some gold does come out. We've shown that, even though... Uh, Bachris initially balked and said it didn't, and we could show that there was a brown auric hydroxide forming on the cathode. That happens at thousands of volts. Uh, this was actually run a little bit lower, which is what we do in co-depositional systems. And what was done here was uh, we created the co-depositional layer using a palladium as the anode. The definition of the anode is the electrode that corrodes. So if it corrodes, it goes into solution. Once it goes into solution, the palladium is charged. I showed you the flow equations yesterday, and that drifts towards the cathode where it deposits. So this, this material is palladium co-deposited on the palladium, followed by a second anode, which was gold. And our problem was the whole system heated up so much that we had a fracture of our electrode. Two, two anodes at the same time, or did you replace No, them? only one. They were in there at the same time, but only one was electrically connected at the time. And the other one was unprotected. Um, it, it wasn't biased. It was not, it was not biased. So it was, it was unprotected. It was unprotected, correct. I may have pulled it out. I'd have to check the lab notebook. What is unprotected? We don't. What is unprotected? Oh, uh, if your cathode is biased cathodically, uh, as Mitchell is arguing, um, if it's anodically, then it corrodes and dissolves. If it's cathodic, it's protected, so it's not to grow. And if it's unbiased, um, it, it can corrode also, but it doesn't corrode uh, as fast as if you're biased, but uh, anodically. So, you may have pulled it, as I remember. Mitchell, it seems to me that this, this might actually be the most heroic um, electrochemical excess power result in terms of uh, gain here of uh, any of your experiments. So is, would it be the case, should I assume that you try to do it again, or you pursue the same <coughs> research because it's very promising, or you have some understanding as to why the excess power was so high, or that kind of discussion? We can go back and talk about it. Um, <laughs> it did not last that long. I mean, the reason we get we get these levels now of energy gain with the nanor where we can run for hours and hours. Now, I haven't done a, a, a mano a mano fight between the DAP. Again, again not, not the question. Do we have any idea why this one works so well? Did, did we learn something from this experiment? I have to think about that. Obviously not enough. What was the short term? Was it 10 minutes, an hour? Or? It was minutes. Yeah. It's, what, it's, it's minutes. I'd like to uh, I, I don't know if you can see this here. This is between 1 and uh, 1,000 minutes. Okay. And so the we actually lost it right around here. So it's like 30 minutes, something like that, 40 minutes? On that order or less, yes. This is with nickel. We also got the uh, infrared outputs. Less heroic, we didn't get that much gain. I guess at the time I was just looking for infrared and, and uh, the Stirling engines, and this did not have the gusto to keep going. And so our interest was how could we keep these Stirling engines going and going and going? And this one, although it had a high level of energy gain, it just did not last. 
our results were that we were able to show what I thought was near thermal, but might just be thermal output. We should put a question mark there, I guess. From these co-fusion fusor devices, both for the dual anode fusor, that's the TAP, where we start off with palladium. And uh, see, I, I add here that it's palladium hydroxide in the solution because once you polarize the palladium as an anode, you're going to end up getting the metal itself in the electrolyte. And uh, we do the high impedance ones where we don't do it. We see here we got more out, like you say. Uh, we think the color temperature was around 800 degrees C. The important thing <clears throat> I thought was important, now I've got to go back and think about if it's non-thermal or just thermal and calibrated thermal with excess energy, is that two controls are needed if you do it. There does appear to be a linkage between the excess power gain and what, whether it's thermal or non-thermal near infrared emission. We only get it when we get the excess energy coming out. And we've seen this for several types. The high impedance fusor without the added salt, the dual anode system where we dissolve part of the anode to do a co-depositional layer. And uh, we only saw the rise of emissions only over the active cold fusion device. And I guess we'll have to go back and think whether that's due to volume and specific heat issues, uh, as Peter brings up. There was one other interesting thing I'd like to talk about here, which is there was a lot of talk, if you remember initially, about the fact of um, Huizenger's three miracles. How could it be that cold fusion was done and the experimenters weren't dead? Why was there not penetrating radiation? Peter's given a good example, because the helium is born, as he's shown, with a very low energy of KeV, 10 keV or so, rather than 24 MeV. But there's another issue that we thought of at the time, and that was let's look at the equations. And the Bremsstrahlen output power calculation actually has temperature in it. Well, what happens if we look at the difference between hot fusion and cold fusion? What we find out is, oh, hold on a second here, good. What we find out is that, I'm missing a slide, is that not only does the forward throwing power of Bremsstrahlen fall by about 18 orders of magnitude, if you read the paper, by going to cold fusion temperatures from hot fusion, but also the wavelength changes and becomes very long. And in fact, when I put the numbers in, goes into the infrared. So one of the things we were wondering before we had um, Peter's analysis of the fact that the helium-4 is born with low kinetic energy is the equations indicated, if they were also good at these low temperatures, that in fact, one, the forward throwing of penetrating radiation should drop by 18 orders of magnitude, which would have protected the experimenters right out of the math. And two, that it should move from the penetrating ionizing radiation frequencies down to the infrared, where it would be skin depth locked. And we can you know the physics of this as electrical engineers. Any questions? Um, uh, um, if you would, uh, uh, if you could rephrase this in one phrase, uh, how come the researchers isn't dead from the radiation uh, as simple as possible? How would you phrase this? I think the best explanation is what Peter gave last week. That when you do the analysis of, he was talking about using and correct me if I'm wrong trying to paraphrase you, the fact that the aqueous heavy water is a detector in itself, because it is, and the loaded palladium is a detector in itself, and by what we look at, what we observe, he can calculate that the helium-4 is born with very low energy. And that is the reason, <clears throat> is that correct? That's the reason that you don't get the penetrating radiation. There's apples and oranges. It, it, it is the case that if you look at the, the palladium tutor as a detector, you can calibrate it with enough to limit on the alpha particle. But what follows from that is that whatever it is that's going on here is not DE fusion as is in the textbooks. And it's, 
hot fusion and that corresponds to a Rutherford picture reaction. This is a new process. We, we haven't seen it before. There are, this process is in the textbooks. And it's interesting, too, that the math follows it. I think there's a, there, there's a lot of attention to, uh, from the scientists in the field for controls. Uh, we try to make direct electricity. I'm, I'm going to continue to try and just introduce you to little bits of what we've been doing and going over it rather quickly uh, in order to, to get to where at least I'd like to do, which is up to where we did the demo with the nanors. Here, we were trying to make direct electricity. So there are two ways to do it. One way is to take the excess heat. And, first of all, why would we do it? We would do it because the advantages would be using an ultra clean source instead of oil. We have a lower cost than oil because we're getting more energy out, as I showed you, uh, for the same amount of input. And uh, we would have a high efficiency and it would be clean. So our early work was trying to take these systems and putting them up to thermoelectrics. Now, you, it's, we're obviously handicapped by Carnot efficiency, but we measure it anyway, and our goal was even despite the Carnot efficiency, which is probably going to be in the range of only about under 20%, we had to give it a try and see what we could do. Um, it was the first LED we turned on back in around 19, I think it was 94 or something. So what we tried to do was, can we take the fusor, put it through a thermoelectric converter, and then take the thermoelectric device and put it up to an LED or something, a radio, and turn it on? That was stage one. Stage two was, how could we take the output and then jack the voltage back up? Because remember, with the fusors, our voltages tend to be higher than other people. Uh, most people who do cold fusion, it's 10 volts, 40 volts. Sometimes we go as high as 3,000 volts at much lower currents because we're using a system where we haven't salted the solution. So our goal was to try and do electrical feedback to make a break-even self-sustaining system. I mean, if you're going to convince skeptics, maybe the best way would be to have a device sitting in your desk and just power a light bulb. And it's much tougher than we thought because the first stage was how could we take our thermoelectric converter and now store the energy. I was an idiot and added a fuel cell. I'll show you why that's so dumb later. Um, and how could we then take it and start upping the voltage? So we set up a system with a feedback loop. And what we found out was uh, how much peak feedback could we get? And we used a nickel system with ordinary water. We presented the results at ICC F10. Um, our VOC, remember we were using open circuit voltages to determine how effective our devices were. If it was less than 0.7 volts, we would never see excess energy. Uh, 2.4 was fantastic. We actually get much higher now with the nanors, but that's, that's a separate story. And could we then take the energy and feed it back on itself? That is. Could we take the thermoelectric converter, 
maybe put it through an electronic circuit and get maybe five volts, then put it through another voltage amplifier, get back up to the five, well, here it was a thousand volts, and then bring it back up to the driver. And then we could just peel off some to our little light bulb. And what we found out was that the losses killed us. We were losing energy everywhere. It turned out the biggest mistake I made was using a fuel cell. Because the fuel cell, if you end up making hydrogen to store and then back, you end up losing. Uh, here's the actual data. I don't know if you can read this. Basically, we found that 55%, 54% of our energy was wasted by putting a fuel cell in the circuit. So then if you try to do it, just jump ahead and skip that part. You want to leave that out. We found that we were losing 4% of the energy in our first build-up. This was in our second build-up. To my astonishment, we ended up wasting an incredible amount of energy in the wires and switches. That was 5%. I, I learned a lot from this. We did not achieve uh, break-even. Hi. Go ahead. Let's see. There was a successful effort that actually did. Um, the Piantelli group reported at uh, an Italian uh, conference uh, last April, uh, April of last year. Um, basically, a self-sustained operation with no uh, input. It ran a something in the general neighborhood of uh, 70 watts. It's a palladium, uh, palladium nickel hydride uh, uh, classical Piantelli system. So the self-sustaining operation, uh, even though this effort was not uh, successful, there has been a self-sustaining operation for uh, multiple months uh, scale. Did but they present that the elsewhere? Theory? I'm sorry, what? Is that and then I said that would generate electricity or self-sustaining through other mechanisms. Well, it, um, the Piantelli experiment, some electric chemical experiments, right. gas loading of uh, nickel, and uh, as a result, no um, currents required in order to drive things. Um, it turns out that it, it tends to work better at higher temperature in that energy regime. So the trick would be to produce enough heat it's the same uh, temperature uh, to keep things going, and, and that was achieved. And uh, it ran at some number 270 degrees Sweet. C or other times. I might, I, I might, uh, I might not be right about that, but uh, you know, it's certainly hot enough, but to do something uh, interesting. So thermal to electric energy. Um, we'll come back to this later. We, we have also used the nanomaterials to try and make direct electricity. Okay, let's switch to nanomaterials. We're going to get rid of all of the heavy water, make something new. And also, instead of having to be stuck with Norton equivalent current sources, uh, we're going to make it so we can use any voltage source. dry cold fusion device. These are the nanors. Okay, the difference between where we're talking about now is how can we take cold fusion, make it dry, put it into something where we have two terminals so that normally with a resistor we put in a voltage source across it, electric lighting, our electric field intensity through it. We get a secondary current conduction and polarization. With a normal resistor, 
we have V times I for the uh, power that's coming out and energy, V times I times T for the time interval. And with cold fusion, can we now make a device where it's dry and uh, we get excess energy? And the answer is we can, and I'll show you how. Now, there's a lot of people involved in this. We've done many studies looking at ultrasound radiation, direct electricity production, electric breakdown initially, imaging. You can read the rest. Some of these are ongoing. A lot of people are involved. And so the definition of a nanor is it is a dry preloaded. It's a two or four terminal. Some of them are four terminal because I'm measuring the internal resistance of it. Uh, but it's a, essentially a two terminal device capable of energy gain, excess heat, from the applied electric field. It's preloaded. And again, we use an OMA control, which we usually put next to it of the same size. And uh, we'll usually put our core temperature measurement device right in between the two so that we can measure them in the mass of both and affects both. And we have a simple calorimeter that we can measure. And the excess energy is defined as the net energy difference between what we put in and what actually comes out. And minus one, obviously. So what are these nanostructured materials? And what they are are zirconia, ZRO2, which is essentially an insulator, that we end up doping. It's not real. I, I take that back. Doping means you put a very tiny amount in. These are closer to chocolate chip cookies, where think of the cookie as being zirconia, ZRO2, and the chocolate chips are hydrided or deuterided. Um, palladium or palladium nickel alloys that then we add the hydride to. They are highly processed. It turns out that uh, when these materials are first made, you add the zirconia, the metals, it comes out looking like Christmas foil. You know those things you put on Christmas tree? When we get done, it comes out looking like bituminous coal. Then we further process it. We add uh, we add the deuterium. So the interesting things about these nanostructured materials is, one, you get very high loading by calculation. We don't totally know where it goes, but we're getting a net loadings that are three or greater compared to the palladium where we, it's heroic to get up to 1.2, 1.3. Here it's quite easy to get the high numbers. <laughs> God bless you. But it might be that we're having areas within the nanostructure that's not active. So when we see three, it may not be all within the active material. The zirconia is known to prevent the island aggregation of the metals, and that results in what we're going to show you, which is a breakdown. Now, the nanostructured materials are very difficult to prepare and hold and control. When we first started making them, we were losing our vacuum pumps and equipment. They were showing up everywhere. In fact, one of the people ended up um, having what we think was a bursitis from it. And uh, I'm very worried about the health problems. So the reason we made the nanors are we can hermetically seal them and keep these. They're not dangerous, but they're potentially dangerous materials in a confined space where it won't bother the equipment and won't bother the people. And our goal was to make these devices hermetically sealed and entrap them so that then we could apply the electric field intensity, look for other types of activation like ultrasound, magnetic fields, etc. These are what we call nanor type cold fusion devices. What we wanted to explore was do they have excess heat properties? How many ways can they be deuterated? What's the impact of ultrasound? And what's the impact of applied electric and magnetic field intensities, which was how I was looking at trying to activate them. And this is what they look like. We've gotten them from a number of periods of late Talbot Chubb, uh, sent some through Dennis Cravens, Dennis Letts that they got from Murata, Brian Hearn made a few, we had our own that we made up, and this is what they look on, like under electron microscope. 
there uh, Pam Boss put some on with Larry Forsley on some tape and did some SEM up close. And here we see the analysis, that's the zirconia from the zirconia peak. We can see the nickel and the palladium. Uh, processing turns out to be a key factor. We're spending a lot of time looking at domain size, which are actually smaller than here. And we've tried various ways of, of measuring them. And this was just one that may or may not. This is actually what the first ones look like. Here's the nanomaterial. This is about a centimeter and a half across. The zirconium material here, it's got a specific gravity of about 3.7. The electrical resistivity before you do anything to it is around four megaohm centimeter. That's four megaohm centimeter. That's obviously wrong, but that's okay. And uh, the advantage is, unlike with the fusor, where we have to have very expensive uh, palladium, gold, or platinum coming out. Here, of course, I can connect it up with uh, copper. And the first ones we're using olefins to cover them. Then we had the series two nanors where we put the temperature measurement device in. We had later ones, we had ion exchange membranes. And what we try to do here, this is a schematic where if I show you here, we can see a, uh, a voltage source come through here to ground. What we're looking for are products out, heat coming out, and can we make our own electricity by having other input coming in? Yes. Um, you said they were hermetically sealed? Yes. So. There's well, no you'd have to cut them open. I mean, this is a schematic diagram. Right, but there's no danger of, um, you know, hydrogen gases coming out and bursting the thing? We, we'll show you some. We have had, we're, as a result of their heating up, we've had a catastrophic decompression. Nothing is danger, and I don't think it's nuclear at all. I think we're just making gas where the D2O comes out. But it's come out, we'll, we'll show you some of that. In fact, after... Uh, and what we did is we made uh, what we call the cold fusion transistor, where we're, we're putting an applied electric field intensity here. We're loading a second way here. Um, this is before we learned how to really do it and get it preloaded. This is on the way. And then looking at the effect of ultrasonic irradiation. It was our setup before we learned how to make it simple. The thing that really helped us was what we called the Nanor Explorer, which is a whole automated circuit for running these devices. And again, I'm going to use the uh, baseball analogy. The calorimeter is the stadium, the Nanor is the batter, and our Nanor Explorer is the pitcher catcher that really controls how much electric current is going to the Nanor. Because as I'm going to show you, the nanors have internal impedances that change between uh, 100 gig ohms and uh, let's say 10 kilo ohms. Now, if I don't know how many of you are electrical engineers, right? If you go to make a device that has an internal impedance of 100 gig ohms, that's a more insulating material than the circuit board you're going to put it on. And the big problem we had with these when we first started making them was internal leakage through the board. Things that we, when you normally make a circuit and you connect up to a circuit where the circuit board's insulated. But compared to the NANOR at some of its stages, the circuit board was leaking. So when I first made the demo last year to take the Peter's course, the box started off this high, and the reason it ended up in the Tupperware drum was we made the circuit in here. We actually had to build that first circuit where we couldn't use a board. The wires were just held in the air because I couldn't deal with the leakage of the board itself. I think we're past that now, but last year it was a major problem. So our new Nano Explorer replaces the old driver. It's much more efficient. And in the end, it provided a reliable, low-power, high-efficiency energy production device when it was coupled with the NANOR. Yeah? I'm a little confused. Uh, you said these are dry devices. Are they operating dry as well? Yes. So what if, uh, just, based, just off of the uh, 
No. These are not being replenished now. Yes. So, Mitchell, you, you talk about your baseball uh, type analogy. Um, perhaps would a uh, diode analogy be a more useful uh, analogy here? Um, so for diode operation, and you're running a thing, there's a regime where it's not going to pass very much current. Well, I think you're right for describing the device itself, but somebody has to sit there and adjust the voltage source. Okay, I'll give you an example. When we do a run, and this thing, as I'll show you, has a breakdown avalanche and goes from gig ohms to kilo ohms, often I'll see a flash as I lose a piece of thousand dollar equipment. Okay, so we had to build a box. That would, and we haven't erased <coughs> that occurring, but now it only happens maybe once a week, which is a problem. But the reason I use the baseball analogy is somebody has to be there to deal with the applied electric voltage and turn it down. And uh, so I'm actually, I'm not talking about just, just the diode. It's actually, think of that diode analogy that you have, where if you had too much current going through it, you'd blow it up. So how do we measure the excess energy, if any, in these devices? What we did was, here's our electric source. We take the OMA control. We take the NANOR. We put the, uh, one of our measurement devices right here. We have multiple devices. We have, typically, we'll put, and also, what you don't see here is a mask. We'll put the, uh, the NANOR in, the control in, the device between, a big thermal mass on top, thermal mass on the bottom. We'll have temperature measurements all through it. Then we'll put it inside a relatively uh, adiabatic material so that we only have heat flow coming out in one direction. That way I can then stick a heat flow sensor on here, you see. So we're able now to measure, one, we can do our delta T measurement. We can do the full bore calorimetry like I showed you yesterday. And we can measure the heat flow. out. So by setting it up this way, we have three different systems for being able to verify if there is excess heat, if any. And then we compare the heat that's coming out to the input. And because this is close to DC, it's voltage times current times the, the time integral of that. Any questions? And we do what we do before, time integration, thermal waveform reconstruction to check our calorimetry, make sure we, we really know what we're doing. We adequate Nyquist sampling, yada, yada. Uh, and to ascertain activity, after we, we go for verification. We go for three methods, and we want to time integrate. So we do these parallel diagnostics, and here they are. Delta T over power in. The reason we don't just do delta T is you can't compare different power inputs. You might not get the same power input into the OMA control that you do to the cold fusion device. And when we set it up this way, you'll see that they come out to be straight lines, and then we can take that ratio like I showed you yesterday. Same thing for the heat flow. By doing input power corrected heat, this is a mistake. It should be input power corrected yeah, heat flow. Uh, we're also able to compare and get out the energy gain by that. Then we do our calorimetry, as I showed you yesterday. We do uh, the time integration and noise measurement to rule out false positives. As before with the aqueous systems, we I guess we, we, we use the standard way of measuring power, voltage times current. These are our accuracies. They're, they're pretty good. Okay, let's go to the next one. Questions? Okay. Uh, when I first started looking at this problem, we were using materials we got from Brian Ahern. And I published this paper with him at ACS. 
And what was the impact of an electric apply to field intensity? The biggest problem we had were two. Avalanche breakdown and incredibly wide impedance swings. Yes. Angela, is your applying electric field intensity in any way re related to an applied voltage? Yeah, it would be the voltage divided by the distance. But in a sense, it's, it's, you're just applying a voltage here, right? I am just it's applying a voltage. It's less mysterious and complicated than we're making it sound. I guess it's a 603 and 607 lingering thing. Um, I'll switch to voltage. We'll, we'll make it simple for people. Go ahead. If you, if you take this just as a two-terminal device, what are the VI characteristics look like? If you just sat there with a voltmeter and a manager and said, plot, plot the curve, what is it? What is it okay. Here's one of the first ones we did. Here we're looking at the, uh, well, we can get the current from the impedance. Here's the impedance. Here it's up at, uh, this is 3.6 times 10 to the 6 ohms, okay? So the current is going to be the voltage over the resistance. Here's our applied potential in volts. So let's say right over here we got 3.5 3 million ohms. And uh, to do that we put across 7 volts. So we're using Keithley picometers to measure here. We blew a few of them. I blow around a lot of equipment. One of the biggest problems we have is uh, the sudden change makes it very difficult without the controller to keep your equipment intact unless it has a wide ability to measure current. And as most of you will find, if you do experiments, your voltmeters will survive this. Your ammeters will not. So everything is happening near zero volts. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm let me. We, Got interrupted. I'm going back to my talk. Let's let's take the nanor, and uh, we're doing four terminal measurements here. And this was the first run I did, but we kept doing it. We went to a higher voltage, and here's the sudden breakdown. Okay. See, I like to repeat stuff over and over before I publish. So we did this maybe 10, 15 times, and then I realized if we went to higher voltage, there was a sudden voltage breakdown. In this one, it happens at about, I don't know, this was 23 volts or something. But this, this was one particular one where we built it to examine it. And what we see is all of a sudden the impedance drops. And here we see, for example, now I called it, it's Zener-like behavior. I'm not really certain how we can characterize this except that there is an avalanche. Here as we increase the voltage, here we see voltage goes from 110 and 100 volts. Here is the electrical impedance going from a kill ohm up to 10 mega ohms. And here's the device, ding, 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 ding. That's what you saw in the beginning. And all of a sudden, kaboom. And of course, when that happens, all of a sudden your power is flying through it. And that ammeter that you had set down to measure nano amperes flashes. And you have to buy more equipment. Yeah. Mitchell, after you talked about the state of the port, some of us went back to dig into the literature to see what folks know about it. And there's literature showing uh, basically the eye characteristics, something like this, <coughs> associated with uh, breakdown of oxide layers around the metals. So that it, it, it may not be such a mysterious uh, effect here. In a sense, if you like, you've got these conducting chocolate chips in your cookie you're applying a voltage. If you're going to get current to flow, the only way the current's possibly going to flow is by breakdown between the individual like metal parts of the system. So you've got uh, zirconium oxide, zirconia regions between your metal contacts. With enough voltage, they're going to break down. In fact, the breakdown voltage is in the literature uh, in this case. So you'd have the possibility of comparing your ID characteristics against literature values. Good question. Also, the fact is it's well studied physically, so we were able to expand on the equations to try and analyze it maybe a bit better. So yeah. is that reversible once you get past that mean? Good Can question. Darn, good questions. There are three regions, and there is hysteresis. OK, so for example, uh, here, we go up to here, it's 2 mega ohms, 10 kilo ohms, 4 kilo ohms, we come back. 
and there is slight hysteresis, but it is reversible over time. Good question. Now it turns out, which, if any, have excess energy? Well, when I gave this talk last year, we pointed out that, uh, no, let's go to where we are this year. We think that, uh, here's region one. We think this is the region where we're getting excess energy. And as I'll show you later, once we go to breakdown, we lose it. At least in our system. Maybe in a different system, it's different. So we have our initial high resistance region. Somewhere along here, we get the excess energy. We think over here. We don't like it here because that's where we start losing equipment. Though if we could figure out how to get energy over there, we'd obviously be getting more net power out. So that would be good if we could pull it off. But for what I'll show you later, that's not where we see the excess energy. So our bottom line is our summary of these investigations were, one, these are complex materials that have, um, I called it unique, but as Peter points out, we do see breakdown through other oxides, but they may not have been made with the palladium and the hydrides and the nickel like this does. And certainly in the cold fusion field, this was unique. So that's what we meant by unique complex properties. We see that they have uh, up to 100 gig ohms, especially as we start loading it. We're getting very high impedances. We were seeing avalanche breakdowns. And this, here it says 24 to 37. Some of them are much higher. We go, some of them have to go to hundreds of volts. At the avalanche, the impedance suddenly, reversibly, decreases, though there is some hysteresis there, and it goes to much lower values. Questions? Okay. Um, it took a while to learn how to get excess energy out of the nanors, and our series three gave us a little bit of excess energy, but a lot of things that we learned about how to get them to run. So, for example, here is uh, this is a, then this is a measurement at two second intervals. Um, this is time, but what this means is we're over here at around just under 4,000 seconds. I apologize. In order to deal with our control device, I'm going to show you a lot of things where we have counts. And the counts are one where we, um, each count is where we do a temperature and voltage check of all things. And when you see the counts, it'll tell you what you have to multiply the counts by to get the total time. And I apologize, we haven't corrected this. So here, we are looking at input and output power. Here we're looking at input and output energy. Sort of like yesterday. Uh, in fact, that part is exactly like yesterday. So here's our Roma control. Here we put in this much power. We get out this much power. And we can see these parallel lines like yesterday for the Roma controls. And we take a break. We have our cold fusion device. We put this much power in, same as the Roma control almost. And we get a little bit more out. And we can see that our net energy gain is over here. Okay. Now this device, um, this device actually was, uh, was filled with ordinary water. Uh, I, when we first made these, we were actually uh, beginning them with uh, loading from solution. We changed that a lot. But this one is a nickel-based nanor, and that's what it refers to. And we're just getting a tiny amount of excess energy out here, but it's measurable. Here again, we found that whatever we measured is lost in region three. Here's the, uh, okay, let's look again. This is important. So here's about uh, 4,000 seconds. Here's a run through the OMA control. Here's the run through the cold fusion device. And we're driving it in region three after breakdown. So the OMA control, we get a nice match for power. The energies are here. And what we find is, Here's our input power to the nanor, and we're getting less out. This is sub 
over, it's clearly not over unity, and maybe we're putting the energy into other processes that are dissipative that we're not picking up as heat. So here's our input jewel. This, so it's, an, it's not an excess energy. If it was excess, this red dotted line would be up here. That was an important lesson for us. Now, when we got it to work, I don't know if you followed any of Bob Bass's work, but he had often talked about that we need five needles to prove cold fusion. And he was referring to the fact that we want to look at five levels of increasing input to show increasing output. And here we show it. Here's the, uh, the delta T. What we want to do is we're looking at the uh, delta T over input power. Input power normalized delta T is a function of time. So it's these ratios are the excess energy. Mm -hmm. What is it even an optimal operating point? Why five? Pardon? Why five? That was his paper. I just tried to match it. I, I, just like your ideas yesterday, we wrote them down. I'll try and do it if we can, or encourage somebody else to do it. There's so many good ideas coming out of people, we wanted to try it. Um, here, here again, we see over, uh, this is about 12,000 seconds. Uh, here's our control, 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 control. Eventually, at higher input power, we're not, ca we're not capturing all of the heat coming out. But for the cold fusion device, we put in this, we get more, 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 more. Here's our excess energy. And so for this one, which was again a series three, we're showing definite excess energy. And here's our thermal power spectroscopy. Again, here we're looking up to about 20,000 seconds, so we're about a third of the day. And uh, here's our OMA control, OMA control, OMA control. Ding, ding. And here, with the cold fusion device, here's our, our input. Here's our detected, 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 detected. And if we take the ratios of this to this, that's our energy gain. And here, in joules, we're getting out about 500 extra joules over a third of the day using the Series 3 nano. <coughs> and this is a dry, two-terminal device that we ended up running uh, in November. We hadn't quite set up the demo yet. Um, we use these systems are incredibly effective for us to evaluate additives. I mean, I'm interested in getting more energy gain out, getting more longevity of the device, and some other things. And so one of the things we found the Nano are exploring and they are incredibly helpful for is suppose we want to evaluate the impact of an additive. So here we added, um, well, it says what it is, it's silver doping. And in fact, the excess energy disappeared. So here's the OMA control, OMA control, OMA control. And in fact, what we found is uh, we're, we're getting less excess energy out. Now, series five and six were a little different. We found a wonderful way to glue the deuterium into these hydrides so that we could make the pre-activated device. And so what we have here in series five and six are what we think is a revolutionary new type of nano art. And what they feature are these nanostructured materials um, this is basically what they are. When, when you look uh, before processing, the zirconium is usually about two thirds, and with the palladium and the nickel varies between zero and thirty percent, depending what we put in. But we're looking at the zirconia with, with uh, the ones we showed at MIT was pure palladium with deuterium, and the ones I showed you in series three were mixtures. And essentially, what we do is we add these other materials in a proprietary method where now we have a completely preloaded system, and that's series five and six. And the reason they're helpful is dry, contained, super handling pro uh, properties so that we can make them portable. I mean, we brought them here to MIT. When we did the demo in 2003 with the Fusor, on the way back, the heavy water all spilled. Could have been the other way. Could have been that it spilled coming here. And 
to have a real portable device that you can pick up and say, here, Robin, you can do your experiment, or Richard, I think that's a big improvement over where we're going. Okay, so we took one of these devices and brought it here to the course, the IAP course last year. We'll show you that in a little bit. And ran it from uh, the 30th to the 31st. What a lot of people don't know is we kept running it. We ran it for an additional four months here. We took it to two other locations and we made a lot of discoveries because we could then take this active device and look for the impact of other types of uh, irradiations and uh, operations on it. Yeah? I'm having trouble 